Hello. We're going to continue part two of the introduction. With this background, let's return to the play and see how Frayne handles the meta-ethical dilemma he poses. Miming Bohr's propensity for working through physics problems by writing multiple drafts of a paper, Frayne offers his audience three possible scenarios. Three complementary drafts exploring different points of view for what occurred during the conversation between Bohr and Heisenberg on the occasion of Heisenberg's visit to Bohr in 1941. The first draft is largely a presentation of Heisenberg's point of view, replete with embellishments, compliments of Jung and Powers. Bohr's wife, Margaret, is a major figure in the second draft. She represents the informed majority public opinion, consonant with the majority view of the physics community, which rejects Heisenberg's claim to have been consciously working to thwart the German bomb project, and largely sees the failure of the project to be the fortunate result of Heisenberg's failure to appreciate the relatively small amount of fissionable material needed to make a bomb. The third draft is where Frayn's philosophical interests in the play come to the fore. There are two important elements to the third draft, which delivers the play's conclusions. One brings the analogy between the unknowability of physical states and psychological states to its climax, and the other explores the limits of the analogy. The final draft highlights Frayn's point that we are prohibited, in principle, from knowing our own thoughts, motives, and intentions. The only possibility we have of catching a glimpse of ourselves is through the eyes of another. Heisenberg. And yet how much more difficult still it is to catch the slightest glimpse of what's behind one's eyes. Here, I am at the center of the universe, and yet all I can see are two smiles that don't belong to me. Bohr. I glance at Margaret, and for a moment I see what she can see, and I can't, myself, and the smile vanishing from my face as poor Heisenberg blunders on. Heisenberg. I look at the two of them looking at me, and for a moment, I see the third person in the room as clearly as I see them. Their importunate guest, stumbling from one crass and unwelcome thoughtfulness to the next. Bohr. I look at him looking at me, anxiously pleading me, urging me back to the old days, and I see what he sees. And yes, now it comes, now it comes. There's someone missing from the room. He sees me. He sees Margaret. He doesn't see himself. Heisenberg. Two thousand million people in the world, and the one who has to decide their fate is the only one who's always hidden from me. Just as Margaret has explained in an earlier scene, on his own, Heisenberg cannot really know why he came to Copenhagen, because he doesn't know the contents of his own mind. His own mind is the one bit of the universe he can't see. On the heels of this scene, Heisenberg and Bohr go outdoors for their walk, a chance to have their momentous conversation out of earshot of any bugs planted in Bohr's house by the Gestapo. Bohr. With careful casualness, he begins to ask the question he's prepared. Heisenberg. Does one as a physicist have the moral right to work on the practical exploitation of atomic energy? Margaret. The great collision. Bohr. I stop. He stops. Margaret. This is how they work. Heisenberg. He gazes at me, horrified. Margaret. Now at least he knows where he is and what he's doing. There we have it, a moment of knowing. Heisenberg can glimpse his own intentions, but only through the horror of Bohr's face reflects as he gazes back at Heisenberg. As soon as this knowing interaction has taken place, Bohr uses the momentum of his anger to fly off into the night. 
but he stops short. He has an idea for how to get at this issue once and for all. He suggests a thought experiment. Bohr, let's suppose for a moment that I don't go flying off into the night. Let's see what happens if instead I remember the paternal role I'm supposed to play. If I stop and control my anger and turn to him and ask him why. Heisenberg, why? Bohr, why are you confident that it's going to be so reassuringly difficult to build a bomb with the isotope uranium-235? Is it because you've done the calculation? Heisenberg, the calculation? Bohr, of the diffusion in 235? No, it's because you haven't calculated it. You haven't considered calculating it. You hadn't consciously realized there was calculation to be made. Heisenberg. And of course, now I have realized, in fact, it wouldn't be that difficult. Let's see. Hold on. Bohr. And suddenly a very different and very terrible new world begins to take shape. And then in the productions I've seen, the terrible sound of a shattering bomb blasts fills the theater. As the blasts outside, once again a clarification of the issues comes from Margaret. Margaret, that was the last and greatest demand that Heisenberg made on his friendship with you. To be understood when he couldn't understand himself. And that was the last and greatest act of friendship for Heisenberg that you performed in return. To leave him misunderstood. Better for everyone that Heisenberg, like all of us, is shielded from shining a light on the dark corners of the mind. For if Heisenberg's conscious mind had had access to all its subconscious thoughts, then Hitler might have been in possession of an atomic bomb. And after the dust settled, the world might have found itself in a vastly different geopolitical configuration. A good thing that we have this limitation. In the uncertainty at heart of things that saves our weary souls. Bohr. Before we can lay our hands on anything, our life's over. Heisenberg. Before we can glimpse who or what we are, we're gone and laid to dust. Bohr. Settled among all the dust we raised. Margaret. And sooner or later, there will come a time when all, all our children are laid to dust and all our children's children. Bohr, when no more decisions, great or small, are ever made again, when there's no more uncertainty because there's no more knowledge. Margaret, and when all our eyes are closed, when even ghosts are gone, what will be left of our beloved world? Our ruined and dishonored and beloved world. Heisenberg. But in the meanwhile, in this most precious meanwhile, there it is. The trees in Feilet Park, Gammertingen and Biberach and Mindelheim, our children and our children's children, preserved just possibly by that one short moment in Copenhagen, by some event that will never be located or defined by that final core of uncertainty at the heart of things. In the end, it's because of our humanity, because of our limitations, because we can't ever truly know ourselves that we survive. This is how the play ends. But where, you might wonder, does this conclusion leave us with respect to the question of moral judgment and accountability? Frame makes another important move in the final draft that can perhaps shed further lights on this key question. In the final draft, Frayn drives home the point that he sets out to make. At least he speaks about the play as if he knows something of his own intentions. Because we can't fully know Heisenberg's intention, we can't fairly judge them. Ironically, however, Frayn plants his own judgments about Bohr throughout the play. It is Bohr not Heisenberg, 
Frame tells his audience, who wound up working on an atom bomb project that resulted in the deaths of tens of thousands of innocent people. A reference to Bohr's contributions to the U.S. bomb at Los Alamos following his close escape from Nazis in 1943. It is Bohr, along with his student John Wheeler, who helped to develop a theory of nuclear fission. Bohr is the one who shot another physicist with a cap pistol. Only well into the scene do we learn the true nature of the weapon and the fact that it was all part of a playful interchange among colleagues. The cap pistol reappears near the end of the play as Heisenberg suggests that Bohr could have killed him in 1941 if he really thought Heisenberg was busy devising a bomb for Hitler without even having to directly pull the trigger by a simple indiscretion that would have tipped off the Gestapo about some detail of their meeting and resulted in Heisenberg's being murdered by the Gestapo for treason. More than once, Frayn has us watch Bohr relive an unspeakably horrible moment in his life. Bohr stands abroad aboard a sailing vessel and watches his oldest son drown. What role does this series of repetitions within repetitions play? Heisenberg. Again and again, the tiller slams over. Again and again, Margaret. Niels turns his head away. Bohr. Christian reaches for the life boy. Heisenberg. But about some things even they never speak. Bohr. About some things. Even we only think, Margaret, because there's nothing to be said. One shudders to think that an author would be willing to wield this deeply painful personal tragedy for the purpose of layering bore with every unimaginable kind of life and death responsibility. But this unthinkable hypothesis fits all too neatly with the sleight of hand by which Frain attempts to shift responsibility from Heisenberg to Bohr. Yes, we are told that Bohr was held back from jumping in and going after Christian. But as we watch Bohr's ghost being haunted by the memory over and over again, the terrible suggestion that some things shouldn't be said floats in the air. Can it be? Isn't it the case that in the reiteration of the unspeakable, the unspeakable is spoken? And then there are the loving yet all too facile denials of Bohr's responsibility by Margaret, which of course only serves to highlight his responsibility. Heisenberg, he, Oppenheimer, said that you made a great contribution. Bohr, spiritual, possibly not practical. Heisenberg, Fermi says it was you who worked out how to trigger the Nagasaki bomb. Bohr, I put forward an idea, Margaret. You're not implying that there's anything that Niels need to explain or defend. Heisenberg, no one has ever expected him to explain or defend anything. He's a profoundly good man. All these subcritical pieces, these suggestions of Bohr's guilt planted throughout the play come to an explosive climax just near the end when Frayn unleashes the idea of a strange new quantum ethics, proposing its implications for the moral dilemma we are faced with. Heisenberg. Meanwhile, you were going on from Sweden to Los Alamos. Bohr, to, to play my small but helpful part in the deaths of a hundred thousand people. Margaret. Niels, you did nothing wrong. Bohr. Didn't I? Heisenberg, of course not. You were a good man, from first to last, and no one could say otherwise. Whereas I, Bohr, whereas you, my dear Heisenberg, never managed to contribute to the death of one single solitary person in all your life. This powerful scene is one that remains imprinted in the minds of many audience members. And it's not surprising that it would. Finally, there is some resolution, a moral ground to stand on. 
something definite and concrete to hold on to amid the swirl of ghosts and uncertainties. And so is it any wonder that even though Frame proceeds to disown this conclusion, audiences leave the play with the impression that if anyone should be held accountable for moral infractions, it is Bohr, not Heisenberg.